SEO for e-commerce. Which platform is best for e-commerce SEO? What are some of the most effective techniques for e-commerce SEO in 2023? And how on earth do you compete with Amazon? I'm David Ben, and those are just a few of the questions that I'm going to be asking today's panelists on the Majestic SEO podcast and live stream. So who's going to be on the panel today? Let us find out and ask them to introduce themselves. So shall we start off with Ritu? Sorry, I was on mute. Hi, hi, David. So hi, folks. Uh, my name is Ritu Goyal, and um, I've been in SEO for over 13 years now. And um, so I've handled different things, technical content. So, and main, my main strength is technical. And, uh, and also, I set up my own company, Algo Digital, after working as a freelancer full time uh, for almost 10 years. So Super. yeah, that's me. Thanks for joining us. Also joining Thank us today you. is Paul. Hey guys, my name is Paul Razanov. I'm uh, CEO of the Mage Cloud Agency. Uh, we support probably 100 plus e-commerce businesses on the various platforms with so-called months by months improvements plan. Uh, what brings me to SEO, it's uh, literally uh, the option to fix any technical SEO issues on the website. I'm not that much about the content, but the technical SEO and uh, indexing, that's probably uh, my expertise on this topic. That's okay. We won't direct any content questions to you, at least for the first half hour, probably, then everything's off the table. Uh, let's go to Dominic now. Hi, I'm Dominic Lil. Uh, I've been working in SEO for, uh, depending on where you can say I became an SEO, uh, probably about uh, eight or nine years. Um, and yeah, I mainly work with like smaller clients. I'm, I'm more of a content person in the post of all. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I use content to drive kind of like, uh, you know, traffic towards websites and improve rankings. Paul is quite satisfied. There's a content person on that uh, I can divert the content questions to. Superb. Thanks for joining us, Dominic and Luke. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Depending on whereabouts in the world you are. Um, I am an e-commerce consultant uh, and I've been in e-commerce since the age of 16. I started on eBay selling all sorts of stuff out of my bedroom. And then I got told off by my mum and uh, decided to, to, to make it serious. And then, uh, yeah. I've kind of been running around e-commerce companies for quite some time, but um, I love tech SEO, CRO, uh, and analytics, and I kind of just smush all three of those together on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, yeah, really interested to see what we uh, what we chat about, debate about today. It's going to be fun. Well, my last question was going to be, how do you compete with Amazon? But maybe we should incorporate eBay as part of that as well. Perhaps that you know, they are like an e-commerce competitor as well. We will we, we'll show see. Uh, also joining us today is Evie. Hi, everyone. I'm Evie Ansari. I am the director of Eva Media, which is a digital marketing agency. I have over 11 years of SEO experience and across all three different areas, but my core strengths are in content and technical SEO. Superb. Thank you, Evie. So a wide ranging panel with um, a great deal of experience in SEO, but specialist experience in different areas. So um, anyone watching, um, feel free to ask any questions about e-commerce SEO, and hopefully we can incorporate that as part of the live stream. If you are listening to this afterwards, of course, try and hop on and uh, join us at some other live stream in the future. Majestic.com slash webinars is where you sign up for that. But um, the first topic, let's focus on what platforms best for e-commerce SEO. And we, we can approach this from different perspectives. You know, um, Paul, you know, we'll probably go to you first. You know, we'll talk about platforms from a te technical perspective and what are the pros and cons of each platforms. But then we can get different people's perspectives on perhaps actually content-driven SEO using an uh, e-commerce platform and um, other ways of evaluating whether or not that platform is is the best for that particular task. So, Paul, Paul, should we go with you first? Um, fr from a technical perspective, how do you go about selecting which platform to choose? 
Uh, <clears throat> to be quite honest, when we advise uh, our customers about which platforms they want to select, uh, we're probably not really thinking much about like uh, SEO in place. I'm always trying to say, hey, Google does not really care if it's Shopify or Magento or WooCommerce. It's more about like the structure and stuff like that. So when we pick up the platform, the number one for me, it's the business of the customers, right? So uh, for instance, if the clients are really like a big websites with a lot of customizations, ERP systems and stuff like that, depends on the revenue as well, I can suggest them uh, either, let's say Magento or Shopify. Uh, if it's a website with, let's say 20 products, I will never probably recommend him a Magento because this will be overcomplicated. So long story short, I think the number one decision should not really be based on the like SEO in place, but more about the business needs and the, the stuff that you want to solve. Um, again, we can go very, very much deep. Uh, to my, uh, historically, as of right now, let me tell you the truth. Uh, the top five platforms that I can see based on the migrations, because like I do, oh, when I'm working with the clients, I can, I, I can see how many clients want to leave one platform and move elsewhere. So the top five now, um, uh, Shopify, WooCommerce, VIX, uh, uh, Shopware, and BigCommerce. That's five, which is the top. Magento, that I'm also kind of specialized in, it's out of the top in terms of the migration, right? Um, there are a bunch of the websites, big one, that's still built and uh, kind of um, uh, developed on Magento. But I do see the trend of the clients moving away from this platform for, for a different reason probably cost. So that's that's kind of what I have in mind so far. Wix is an interesting name that I wouldn't have necessarily initially put together with e-commerce there. Uh, so what type of business is using Wix for e-commerce? It's all starting with a small, uh, small companies who just want to build something out, right? Uh, but they also have like e-commerce module that you can activate. I think the, the reason why this platform is in the trend for the migrations is just like probably the smaller guys who eventually started something with other platform. Once they reached out the level when they have to update the plugins or manage the security and stuff like that, and especially security is the key now, uh, to be quite honest, that's one of the biggest factor, uh, what you wanna do and why you wanna maybe uh, utilize cloud-based solutions rather than uh, self-hosted. And I think Wix, it's kind of the easiest platform to start if you're just a one solo guy, you know, and you want to test it, test the market. That's what makes Wix now one of the platform that's trending uh, in, in e-commerce sp specifically. Yeah, and Absolutely. can I just say yeah, that, um, yeah, I actually came across a Wix e-commerce store that was ranking really, really well um, in the UK for, uh, it was a beer shop and uh, I contacted, I was looking to buy some beer and um, yeah, I just kind of had a quick look on SEMrush and it, it was ranking really, really well and it was kind of growing and it kind of almost proved to me that regardless of kind of maybe the reputation that a platform has had, it can rank well um, if you do the right things. That's a good point. Um, I had the benefit of being on the, the Wix board um, for, for, a, for a short stint, and I got to see some incredible stuff. So anyone that's kind of throwing Wix out of the ring um, for, for various reasons, whether you believe it's not developed enough um, or the SEO isn't strong enough, I can tell you uh, without bias, it is, it's really powerful, really, really powerful. And they've just this week actually announced Wix Headless. So if you've got the budget for it, if you're thinking of a headless platform, it's it's a really good uh, option. It's also incredibly fast. Wix has spent a lot of time and resources uh, on making sure that their their default ecom themes are incredibly quick, um, which can always be a tricky one to get right. Right, it's always theme dependent. But um, I think what we're kind of alluding to here already, we've kind of listed, you know, Paul's listed off five. We can probably chew through the pros and cons of all of them individually. Um, but yeah, the, there's never really a one size fits all. But the ones that I feel are best for low to barrier entry is for sure Shopify. Uh, cliche answer because it's good. Um, and Wix, I'd actually seriously consider um, if you're a small business. But equally, if you're enterprise enough and your products are simple, 
Um, and actually, the one thing that a lot of people forget about when we think about SEO is whether it works from a business perspective as well. So integrations into warehouse, fulfillment, um, customizations, that's a big part of something that we as SEOs often neglect and forget to think about. Um, but that to one side, Shopify, Wix um, is, uh, is great. And I'm seeing a lot of people migrating to, uh, as per Paul's point, um, those, those platforms particularly. So, yeah. So does that mean um, that um, WooCommerce is perhaps losing out a lot to Wix? Because I would think that the similar kind of startup or uh, trader selling a, a low number of individual items um, would be possibly selecting for WooCommerce or Wix, or is that not necessarily correct? I don't necessarily think that's correct. I think there's still quite a bit of competition between like WooCommerce and like Shopify, for example, but I think WooCommerce is more of a like smaller business platform because they don't tend to have the budgets um, to essentially pay for something more custom, I would say. Um, I think my one sort of bugbear with Shopify is that they tend to just introduce random subfolders into the URL structure, which most of the other platforms don't do. So from a tech perspective, that's not always the most ideal um, thing to sort of work with. Ritu, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would like to add, uh, so the, one of the clients that I'm working with, so the website is on WooCommerce and that's working really well. So, so they are like right now deciding whether they should move to Shopify and the reason being uh, with WooCommerce, um, they are finding difficult to modify the designs or the landing pages, which they think it's going to be very easy in Shopify. But I completely agree with Yevi. Uh, uh, sorry if I'm correct, uh, saying your name correctly. Um, so um, they, there is an apprehension that once they migrate to Shopify, there will be unnecessary folders and they have to, uh, in the URLs and they have to set up uh, 301 redirects. So there is a risk of losing ranks as well for the URLs that are already indexed in Google. So that's the risk of moving to Shopify. And also it is more expensive moving to Shopify compared to WooCommerce. Convenience costs money, right? Like if you yes. want to take yes. care of them, you've got to pay for it. But um, that, don't get yes. me wrong, I think there's, there's definitely a few inexcusable things that Shopify does. Um, hmm. and we've already spoken about the fact, you know, the classic uh, multiple collection URLs for a similar product and all that sort of stuff. And hmm. it can be fixed, but you know, um, but what I cannot forgive is the redirect manager, right? If you're migrating mm. from another platform to Shopify, it is a real pain to be mm. the person in the driving seat who has to be responsible for potentially yes. tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of redirects. Um, mm. Big commerce is the same. Um, so yeah. they're not free of smoke either. They get smoke just like everybody else. And I would say the most comprehensive redirect um, module that I have seen personally, in my experience, is one that you build yourself. <laughs> or um, WordPress. WordPress redirect managers are typically incredible. Um, but look, then on the other side, Shopify is incredibly easy to use. So that they all have their accolades here. They all yeah. have their challenges and, yeah. and pros and cons. Um, yeah. It really is case by case. Um, yeah. It's going to work best. Where are you coming from? What size? How many products? Um, is SEO that big of a deal? Let's be honest. If you're someone like Sony and you're selling D2C, mm. SEO probably isn't much of a consideration compared to mm. something like UX and simplification yeah. build and all that sort of good stuff. But um, yeah. yeah, it's a thing we can talk about for it. Um, I agree. Yeah, I agree. There is no. But I do think that. Sorry, don't... sorry. Sorry. Me too. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to conclude that I completely agree. There is no one size fit all solution. So it really depends on the business number of products and uh, what's their end goal or what's their strategy, whether it's a B2C or direct to consumer. Mm. And I, I just think it's uh, important to also say that each of these platforms are constantly improving. As you can see with the Wix kind of like headless, you know, announcement, um, all of them know what Google want. And, you know, these, every business is looking for the best platform. And this is kind of, you know, it depends on, I guess, who you speak to. If you speak to an agency that specializes in WooCommerce, then they're going to recommend WooCommerce because it's easier for them. 
but then all like you know wordpress is continuing to improve shopify is continuing to improve and they want to kind of give the best uh platform possible so that they're chosen because obviously the market's um you know busy so i think that's a great summary of the the top five or so e-commerce solutions out there so let's say that someone's made the decision now they've, they've chosen the platform that they want to go for um so maybe we can get everyone's view on maybe the top three things that you have to do initially to get it set up uh, effectively for seo um so shall we go back to paul for the first one there um what, what platform do you want to choose paul and what would your first few steps be <laughs> let me i will be you will be laughing but uh, from my experience, as I'm looking at my clients, the number one to make sure what you do is register your uh, domain in Google Search Console. You can't even imagine how many clients that I work with, they don't really have this set up. And some of them set up by HTTP, you know, without the proper URLs, like a domain management. That's like, that's insane. Like, again, it sounds like a basics, but that's number one. Number two, what I can see, like, uh, biggest mistake that I've seen uh, so far when the client paying for SEO agency to build uh, links to your website and then when you can do, when you check the Google search console you go into the sitemap and you can you can see how many pages actually in Google index it's like maybe like 20% of pages uh, compared what what's in your sitemap and sometimes you're being like Sometimes I, I'm, I'm trying to ask my clients, hey, if 80% of your page is not in Google Index, how you can expect this to rank? And uh, especially when we work with the businesses when they have, I don't know, 20,000, 30,000 of whatever parts, products, that's became a challenge. And uh, in many cases, what they do is they basically grab the data from the suppliers. And then the supplier share this content with so many different other um, you know, um, source. And that's, to my best knowledge, if I'm talking about technical, so and let's forget for, about link building for now, I think that's the two factors that you have to definitely keep in mind as a as number one um, uh, kind of metric. Set up a Google Search Console, watch out what Google recommends you, and pay attention to which, what actually in your Google index. That's that's to my best knowledge. That's probably the two main things to watch. Disregard whatever platform you will be working with. Love specific advice like that. It's great. Um, so let's move on to Evie uh, next. So Evie, once you've got your e-commerce platform set up and running, um, what is the first thing that you do from an SEO perspective? So oh, my first thing, and this is actually quite interesting because I came across this challenge quite recently with a client, is actually to look at the site structure and what the site structure needs to look like, not just for now, but longer term. Because if you've got a client that sells a specific product and they have done their site structure just on that product, over time you'll see as they expand their product base, they start kind of bolting on to the site structure rather than doing it in a way that's scalable and actually um, sensible from a user perspective. So what ends up happening is that it looks really confusing in the navigation and the URL structure and all of that. So actually planning the site structure in line with what it's gonna look like in the navigation and the URLs is the thing that I would look at first. And what tool do you use to plan that? So it's a combination because it's not really like a, you know, easy sort of put it into a tool and it just spits out a site structure situation. It's kind of a do your keyword research and look at what people are um, searching for. Then it's go and use a tool like Miro to like visualize what that ends up looking like and then um, translating that into the platform to um, essentially structure it. Yeah, Miro is one of those cool tools that I've always intended to try, but I've never really tried. But you'd certainly recommend it. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, superb. Shall we move on to Luke now? Um, Luke, what are your first steps from an SEO perspective after you get going with um, your e-commerce platform? Yeah, I am actually going to tack right on to uh, the back of Evie's uh, point on, on site structure. I think taxonomy is the absolute underdog of a number of things, right? One for sure is internal linking. 
um, because that, as we know, is, is the lifeblood of SEO. Um, secondly, it impacts broader than SEO because if your customers can shop and browse easier via a great structure of, you know, I'm working on with a client right now in the world of skincare and we're doing exactly this. Their, their skincare collections, um, because they're on Shopify, are a mess. They're fragmented. They're, there's the sale ones here. There's, there's product-specific ones over there. It's a, it's a madness. So th we need to rebuild it in a sense that allows people to shop, um, flow through the category structure with the parent-child relationship, as I said, internal linking, building the right landing pages to bring all those experiences together. Um, yeah, it's easy to overlook this stuff because it's not really the bowels of technical SEO, but it is in, in such a way. It almost kind of seems like the meat in the sandwich between content and technical, right? Because you really can think about your category names, your category descriptions, how they're laid out, your pagination, your attributes. It's all incredibly important. And that's a lot of technical SEO that normally gets forgotten about. A lot of people focus on product page level. They think of, um, you know, sitemaps, homepage, canonicals, and they're all incredibly important. But it's all in vain if your core category structure isn't working correctly. Um, and the analogy I love to use is how would you experience this if it was a physical store, if it was a supermarket, if it was a department store? What aisle would you expect to find this in? What complementary uh, aisles and, and sub kind of aisles would you expect to find this in? And uh, clients that I work with are, are multifaceted across lots of departments. Um, so I've worked with a, a client in the world of um, beauty, stationery, so broad. Um, and if your categories are too tall or too thin, it can cause all sorts of problems. So spending a lot of time there is is a heck of a lot easier to do now at point zero than it is in two years time where your product is everywhere and you've got to then redirect a load of things and it gets messy real quick. Um, lastly, to tack onto that, navigation. It goes hand in hand, right? If your site nav is out of order, people aren't going to be able to find anything. And normally, it is the number one most clicked uh, element collectively on your entire e-commerce site is your navigation. So it's really important you get that right. Superb. Okay. Now my camera's just turned off. Don't worry about it. Um, I'm still here. Um, it's just because I haven't pressed a particular button. So um, I will edit this out of the replay for audio listeners. But um, you wonderful live stream listeners get this bit of bonus. Um, it will go on again in a minute. Don't worry about it. Um, I just want to ask you a quick follow up question, Luke, and that relates to taxonomy and the, the categories that you were talking about there. Um, obviously, each item can potentially have potentially even tens of categories. How do you go about selecting the number one category that you will reflect in URLs? That's a really good question. So um, one thing you've got to do is to make sure of is that you only allow one permutation of categories to exist, right? So if you have, um, let's say you sell shoes, so you've got shoes and then a subcategory might be men's shoes and then women's shoes, you don't then have women's shoes and then shoes and then another alternative where it's the opposite way around. You always want to have one global way to address that collection or category or even product, right? So the URL structure you should really have is your product URL should be fully independent from your categories as per Evie's point earlier with Shopify, it's a nightmare, right? Um, but saying that as a quick one, when you fix that in Shopify, you lose your breadcrumb trail, which is, there's a compromise somewhere always. Um, it's never straightforward. Um, but that's that's incredibly important is to make sure you've done that. Um, and then lastly, which is something a lot of people sleep on as well, is make sure your pagination is accessible. Because so many people canonicalize their pagination back to the page one of a, of a category. Stop doing that. If you're on Webflow, Webflow is guilty of this all the time. Of what every single Webflow site I've touched out of the box canonicalizes page seven, page eight, page nine, page two, back to page one infuriating um don't do that there's one other top topic in relation to that there's probably dozens but um the, the one that we probably talked about but i think we've talked about before luke is that um you've got a brand and um that brand is popular among male and female um audience um now how do you actually go about determining uh, which URL to try to rank for that particular brand? Do you create an entirely different um, landing page 
for, for that particular brand or do you, do you try and zone in uh, a particular uh, male or female style of clothing? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, David. I think um, I'm going to be going to try my best not to say it depends here, but I would say create multiple subcategories within that brand. So let's say, uh, let me think of a, a, a brand that hits many bases. Um, let's say Nike, right? So kids, men's, women's, um, you can have Nike uh, as a brand parent. So just, you know, slash brand slash Nike, but then you can absolutely have subcategories of that. There's no reason why you can't then have women's, men's, children. And then on top of that, you could also have running, fashion, uh, you know, whatever it is. And you create these structured subcategories, which allows you to then target all of these granular keyword sets. Um, you can actually do this at scale with an automated tool called Simmer.ai, um, which works for the serious kind of enterprise, pretty little thing, um, kind of level, you know, e-commerce retailers where you've got tens of thousands of categories that are built for you automatically to hit that. Um, but on a smaller scale where you work with independent brands, then yeah, look at the search volume. If there's search volume for it, build the collection, build the category, internally link it, create the right silos and, and URL structures. Um, but you're absolutely, the more categories you create, you kind of create more, running to more problems. But typically what you find is the benefit of creating those structured categories offsets the SEO risk uh, mm. and complications. So as long as you have really good foundations, you should be fine. But do not be afraid of creating the right category structure to make it easier for your customers to access your site. And as I said before, that impacts email, SEO, paid search, direct, traffic in general. Um, but it's, it's great for SEO as well. I almost want to jump down the rabbit hole of actually where do you draw the line between too many micro categories that are potentially competing against each other um, and not creating that one authoritative page for that particular category. But maybe we can park that particular thought if that's OK and uh, hopefully discuss that a little bit more later on and move on to Dominic. Dominic, once you've got your e-commerce platform chosen, what are your first steps with SEO? Um. Yeah, it's kind of like expanding on on what the guys said. I, it, other than yeah, to save repeating what they've said, um, you know, I I kind of want to speak to the client and see what their goals are and what they kind of really want to achieve with their SEO. Because as much as we can kind of throw all the research and all that kind of stuff at them, um, you know, if it's not what they want, then you kind of need to keep the client happy as well as their customers. Um, you know, so that's kind of an aspect I think um, is kind of almost after you set up the search console, because um, obviously search consoles can be a massive, massive kind of like bedrock of um, your strategy and how you kind of understand the website and how you can understand the changes that you need to make. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a great thought and um, something that every SEO needs to emphasize as well, because it's very easy to get lost in technical success from an SEO perspective, but unless you actually understand the business and what they're trying to achieve, then your own objectives and goals aren't necessarily marrying up with what the client wants to, to achieve. And even though you might be doing great things for them, they might not be satisfied with you because you're not achieving what they want to achieve. Ritu, exactly. what are your thoughts? Yes, I think uh, very similar to what other guys said. So first would be the tracking and uh, the Google Search Console errors. So yes, it's one of the things that's been overlooked. And uh, Google Search Console is a, I feel it's a box of opportunities, especially the index section. It can give you, um, can actually surprise you with so many things that can be fixed or there's so many problems that are hanging. Uh, so can be uh, fixed and that would be my starting point, uh, followed by looking at the taxonomy and the site structure of the website, how the categories are, uh, how the categories are done and uh, the products. So um, what's the URL structure? Uh, because one of my clients, um, the URL structure was really poor. So what they have done is it's a jewelry website and um, the, the nomenclature of the product is, uh, is um, they have used numbers. So if it's a uh, jewelry hyphen one, jewelry hyphen two. So, so I would check what kind of uh, 
product names they have used. So I would use Screaming Frog for that. I will just do a crawl of their product uh, of the website and uh, get the site structure in Screaming Frog. So in Screaming Frog, there is um, there is an option where you can see the site structure um, uh, in a tree, tree graph. So I find that quite helpful visually and to understand how the site is uh, structured. So that's Obviously, how I would go about it. So, so are, are you a fan of, if, if a client, a new client of yours has horrible URLs um, hmm. that, that maybe don't describe what a particular category is for, you know, they've the got numbers in them or whatever, are you a fan of potentially changing the URLs even though that they're live and, and potentially bringing in traffic? Uh, so, uh, so that would be the plan. I would uh, check the traffic, what traffic they are driving, uh, make sure uh, what I'm suggesting to them, uh, we should not see a risk of losing the, the ranks they have already achieved. So it will be, um, they, it will have to be changed, uh, certainly, but I'll make sure that the redirects are set, 301 redirects are set. But yes, I, uh, it will be difficult to continue with the with the names that are uh, that are not really describing the product. Is anyone in the panel uncomfortable with that? I mean, if you're inheriting an e-commerce site that um, has suboptimal URLs, but is already bringing in traffic organically to those URL, URLs, will we just leave it uh, as it is? Well, if some platforms, they have a limitation. With some platforms, mm -hmm. you cannot get rid of this, like IDs, etc. So that's number one. <clears throat> uh, like, especially I have a client on Presta Shop, which we don't really handle, but they, they literally already have numbers in front of the URLs. And I find there is, seems like a limitation that in many cases, business owner will say, hey, we cannot just do it, right? Or developers will say, hey, we cannot just do it. Everything is technically possible, but then the cost of doing this and, and the benefits could be, could depend, right? <clears throat> so yeah. that I, I think I think we have to also keep in mind if there's any uh, backlinks to this page already established uh, before you start changing the URLs. If yeah. there are shit a lot of nice websites, uh, excuse me for my French. If there's a lot of websites linking to this already URL, is it? So it's probably on case by case basis. You have to make a wise decision. What do you want to do? Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. So that's why it's better to to see the, the history of that URL, how much traffic it's driving and what's its performance like. And then also you need to analyze what are the what is the cost involved in changing the, the URL name um, and yeah, so on. But yes, the site yeah. structure overall has to be one of the things that needs to be looked after as a starting point. Look, look Luke, you were going to jump in about that one as well, weren't you? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's it's difficult, isn't it? If you inherit something that's driving good traffic, good cash, also kind of a pillar page from a paid search perspective, you know, you're playing with a different department there, potentially, or a different person at least. Um, don't fix what's not broken, you know, like. URLs aren't the be all and end all. There's definitely uh, almost like a process and, a, and, a, and a, um, an order to approach things in before you go and attack in URLs. So if you know, for example, um, is there content on the page? Is it the right format? Is it quick? Is it uh, addressing the query as best as possible? Is it mobile friendly? Like all of those things are way more important than uh, you know eight or nine numbers at the end of the URL. Um, yes, of course, it scratches an itch for us to make it like the URL is nice and clean. But at the end of the day, this is money. This is not, um, no one cares about the URL as a user. This is purely search, right? Um, but yeah, there, there's always that uh, trade-off. Um, and I think, you know, certainly working on Shopify sites, um, these limitations kind of come up all the time. Attribute parameters is a real pain um, because you can't index them um for the right reasons mostly but it, you know it interferes sometimes um it's just a case of making the call and, and really bringing it back to the point of is it going to make the client more money and if the answer is no then you probably should just leave it alone um because then we're doing something for us than the, the client if it's your own project site and you've got your own side gig and you want to make it perfect hey go ahead but when you're playing with someone else's till and livelihood you've really got to be careful 
um, we'll be we'll make absolutely sure that you redirects are watertight and that you can pick it back up afterwards. But um, yeah, to Paul's point, sometimes it's just not worth the effort. That's a great phrase. When you're playing with someone else's tool, uh, you're not just mucking about with your own sites. It's the real money you're playing with, and it's not your money. It's someone else's money. So be careful with it. Um, let, let's move on to what an e-commerce SEO strategy is and maybe how you create one, what's incorporated one, how often you have to visit one. Uh, Evie, you're nodding away there. I normally look for victims based upon how engaged they are to what I'm saying there. So uh, thank you for volunteering. Uh, how would you go about um, creating an e-commerce SEO strategy? So I think um, first things first, speak to the client about their goals, right? And really understand what are they trying to achieve? And also who is their target audience? Who are they trying to reach? And it might be multiple different types of people. So that strategy might not be just one strategy. It might actually be multiple different strategies depending on who they're trying to reach. So um, based on all of that information, it's then down to understanding search behaviors and, you know, what are what are people looking for? What kind of content do they want? What are competitors doing? Um, how can you kind of look at leveraging what competitors are doing um, within your own strategy? Um, and then off the back of that, it's a case of so what I tend to do is put together a strategy that, you know, hits all stages of the marketing funnel because SEO doesn't just sit across one stage, it sits across all of them. So, you know, you look at your top of funnel content, mid funnel content, and then bottom of funnel. Um, and then it's also a case of just looking at revisiting that. So it's not just one and done. It's not once a year. It is a continually iterative process of really understanding, you know, what's performing well, what isn't performing, who's engaging with what content, what content isn't working so well, um, all of that sort of stuff, really. I saw Dominic nodding away to some of that there as well. So uh, Dominic, um, what would you agree with? What would you disagree with? And what would you add? Um, I agree with everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it does, it does all start with the client, you know, I tend to work with kind of smaller kind of businesses and, and you've got to kind of understand what they want, what they kind of like understand from their own business, because you've got to understand what's kind of profitable for them. They could sell a thousand different things, but there might be just one thing that's kind of like their big kind of like, yeah, we'll sell, if we sell 10 of these, then we're, we're set for the year, you know, so you've got to kind of have an understanding of the business and the business element of the client um, rather than our own um ideas about kind of what's going to bring them traffic because i think sometimes as seos i know i do as well i get carried away with kind of the research and kind of like the the, the clicks and the impressions and, and these things and being like yeah i'm going to go and get all these amazing things for you and then the client's like well i haven't made any sales then then you're kind of answering kind of some uncomfortable questions um so yeah, it does all kind of start from that and, and kind of gaining an understanding of their website, what it's been doing before um, and and where the traffic's kind of been going. Um, for example, I had one client whose their homepage ranked for like everything they could possibly want to rank for. But then when you're thinking about kind of the end user and the customer, you know, when I'm shopping for something, I don't necessarily want to kind of end up on a homepage. I want to end up on a category page where I can see some products. So the strategy became, let's take away some of these keywords from the homepage and move them onto the category pages. It was a, it was a WooCommerce store. So we started doing that and, and, it, and it's been really effective. Um, so yeah, yeah, kind of having an understanding of kind of like the overall business is, is kind of where any strategy kind of starts and what they want to kind of uh, target. And then you can do research based off that and you can kind of explain to them, okay, this person is searching for this word because it's more commercial. Let's go for this and 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 then develop a strategy around that. I'm sticking with my nodding head analysis. Um, Luke, when Dominic said uh, you've got to start off with a business, um, you're agreeing with that there as well. So, so how do you actually um, tailor uh, an e-commerce SEO strategy to business goals? 
Um, it, it's really simple. I think we as SEOs, well, not we as people, actually, humans like to overcomplicate things. Um, if it makes money, you should probably go on the list. Like it's, it's really as simple as that. If it commercially makes sense, either by making a profit or saving money, then it should probably be there, right? Um, you could have something, for example, that cleans up 30% of all their bloat URLs into the millions, right? As an SEO, that's a huge tick in the box. But commercially, that, make, that might make absolutely no difference at all. Versus, to Dominic's point, you might have a situation where you've got a lot of traffic going to the home page from lots of different terms, but the experience is terrible. So in that sense, redesigning and re-looking at the home page uh, experience is way at the top of the list comparatively. Um, to the point where, so, so kind of like your original question, David, was kind of like, how do you approach a strategy? Um, I typically have a really big uh, audit at the beginning, which is written for the C-suite rather than a technical document, which talks about it. This is where you're losing money. This is where you're making money. These are the solutions. I actually don't do big strategic documents outside of initial audit because things move around so quickly that I put, I used to put so much effort into strategic documents and then I felt like a quarter would pass and everything that we propose would do is no longer important because there's an inventory issue or there's like, I don't know, uh, Adobe's bought another company again and now it's gone to a corporate level where they can't afford it. So we now need to look for an alternative or there's a new product that's come out or the, 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 the CMO is obsessed with chat GPT and wants to replace all the content. And it's like, just look, you kind of just have to be in a situation where I have really light frameworks of where we want to focus commercially and just allowing myself to work almost as if I'm in-house um, because strategies for me are tedious. I find them difficult to do. I love the bigger picture, but writing a big piece of uh, documentative work for me is, is hard for me to do mentally. Um, and normally things don't always go to plan, particularly in e-commerce. Um, but yeah, as long as you're sticking to what's making money uh, or fixing things that are hemorrhaging money as an SEO or as a business owner in general, you're probably going to be all right. Um, easier said than done, of course, but that as a, as a rule of thumb is it, it set me right. So, yeah. And if a client comes to you and says, in two years time or in one year's time, we want to be in this position, we want to be selling double the amount of these products and we were focusing on this. Um, how do you deal with that? I mean, will you try to hit their goals will you try and push back if you find that their goals are unrealistic and will you potentially even suggest other goals if you think there are better goals um that that, that, that would bring more profit or, or more revenue yeah absolutely if someone's going to sit there and say we want to 5x our business over the next two years then that might be feasible because it depends on what 5x looks like doesn't it but um if it seems or feels unrealistic then you've got to be communicative but one of the really important um, prerequisite questions that I love to ask clients before I start with them is, why is it your business needs SEO? Or why do you feel your business needs SEO? And the answers you get are quite profound. Because everybody believes, right, that more of something means more money at the bottom, more traffic in the top, bigger paid search bu budget, more SEO, send more emails, add more products, add more discounts, right? All of these things end up wanting to result in more sales and rarely when you turn up the volume on something does it have the impact at the other end so for me when you get into the nitty-gritty of why they want seo they don't want seo at all nobody wants seo everybody just wants to make more money or to stop losing money and that's where you can look under the hood and think ah okay you don't just have an seo problem you've got a tech stack issue you've got a site search issue your ga4 is overrepresenting your data um, you're not even GDPR compliant. Email is not even part of your strategy. We should look at that. And you get to a point where actually maybe an F SEO doesn't even touch the, the, the worksheet, so to speak, for the first six months. But you're sticking to their plan of making more money. So, I, for example, I have a client who's working with me for a year. Um, we haven't touched SEO yet, but their revenue is up 3x because we've focused on everything that makes money, but they think they're getting SEO right which is you know whatever they don't care what they're getting they just care that the money is coming in at the end of it um and i think that's what's really important is you follow where the money is you understand why they want seo you kind of communicate one thing i'm not saying lie to them but you communicate in a way but you underneath under the skin you're working away um lastly an analogy i love to use is when someone walks into a dealership to buy a car you are not buying a four-cylinder engine 
um, with a gearbox and four wheels and everything else, you are buying a transportation device to get you from somewhere to somewhere. So my point is no one is buying SEO, they are buying business growth. And that's what we as SEOs or we as marketers in general should absolutely be delivering, not a four cylinder engine with four wheels and a gearbox. Great thoughts. Oh, at, at the beginning of this conversation, you talked about um, about five different e-commerce platforms and you said that uh, different clients will um, better suit different platforms. Um, so what would be an example of a client goal that they want to achieve um, that would um, lean you into selecting a particular platform? Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, l l let's... Uh... Uh, talk about Shopify. As soon as, if I'm not mistaken, 800,000 a month, then you automatically switch to as minimum 2,000 a month uh, Shopify fee. Now the question is, are you as a business willing to do that, pay this fee, or you want to be on the health self-hosted stuff? So expense, maybe it's not related to SEO, but that's probably one of the stuff that you have to consider platform-wise. The second thing is, depends on your business. If you're in the vape, CBD, stuff like that. There are some niches that, for example, automatically exclude Shopify as one of the choice, right? Because you want to probably control and you want to be, uh, it depends on the Shopify to make a final decision. Hey, we just shut down your store, right? So in some niches, self-hosted, uh, it's, it's just the number one way to go. Uh, Everything else, like self, like Magento, for example, I love Magento for the fact that you can utilize effectively B2C and B2B on the same platform, right? While by default on the Shopify, B2B is just kind of n n not even there, right? Uh, so that's that's kind of, again, we're coming back to the store, to the question how I decide. That's just a quick samples. Uh, in terms of 2023, uh, question that you asked before, I would probably add here a couple of things like when someone asks me like typical problem, um, I've get a response. I've get a like a feedback like, hey, we just launched this website. Can you check my SEO? That's the most common mistake. Please don't even publish this website before the SEO guy will check it because the cost of fixing issues that's already fucking indexed by Google could be way more than just launch it with no index, no follow, run some Google ads or Google shopping, leave it alone. And then like something like that. Right. So I want to, I want to make sure that everyone who is watching is not coming to the SEO at the end. You should come to the SEO guy at the very beginning of the project. And I would, what we bidding now so much with our clients is what I find is Google loves if you keep producing new content and new pages. It could be landing pages targeting, I don't know, based best Nike shoes design 2023, right? Like a recent content, stuff, stuff like that. Those pages can be optimized with uh, featured snippet. I, I feel this is very underestimated nowadays. If you will be, that's the question, how you can beat Amazon, right? If you will create a page that Google will love because of the data and the featured snippet, that's how you can beat any other very trustful sources, right? So I think if, if, if the SEO as a strategy is in your plate, think about producing new pages and getting them optimized with a featured snippet as much as possible. I said we talk about I... Amazon, and I'm glad that you incorporated Amazon as part of your resp response briefly there, Paul, because I think we're going to have to try and cover Amazon at some point in another discussion panel in the future, because um, I don't think we've got enough time for everyone to have their say on that, and if it's possible to compete directly with it. I, I think you gave some indication as to you know how you have to be really niche-focused, um, and then that will give yourself an opportunity to compete with them and understand things like schema. But let, let, let's move on to Ritu. Um, to have your last thoughts on this particular topic. So what would you like to agree with, disagree with, or add to yourself? So regarding the business, uh, regarding the strategy, SEO strategy for the e-commerce website, um, I think I agree with most of the things that others have said. Uh, understanding the business goal of a client is the foremost thing that I would do. And understanding the flagship products that they have that makes the money, like what Luke said, 
whatever is making money, that's what they're interested in. And if they are coming to us, they are looking for business growth. And they are not looking for traffic or they're not looking for rankings. They just care about revenue. So one of the clients that came to me, uh, so I he worked with me for two months. He was persistent about the the uh sales uh he was he will only talk about sales he's not interested in clicks or impressions or anything else he would just measure his performance how many sales he's getting every month and he just launched the website and he was expecting uh to have 2x performance 3x performance in two months it it is not possible it is not possible so it's better to set the right expectations from the very beginning when you when you start and be transparent but yes uh, i try to uh, talk with client in terms of sales or revenue or whatever their goals are instead of rankings or um, instead of impressions and with the reports that don't make much sense to them but it's important for seo to understand uh, the strategy or how to go about it but uh, not to them. So all they want is more money. So that's that's how about I would go. Great thoughts. <laughs> I've been your host, David Bain, and you've been listening to the Majestic SEO podcast. Uh, let's go around the panel just one last time, just reminding everyone um, who they are and where you can find them. So Ritu, let's stay with you. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you for listening to me. Hope you liked it. So you can uh, contact me anytime on LinkedIn. My name is Ritu Goel. Superb. Thanks for joining us. And also joining us today was Paul. Uh, it's very easy to reach me. My first name dot last name at gmail.com. And if you Google Paul Rezanov, you can find me easily. I'm number one for Paul Rezanov in Google search. How many of you are there? Are there was, it, was it a tough competition to get there, number one? Uh, not really. I like I've got <laughs> I've got some links from incredible resources, so I'm fine. Thank you. Superb. Okay. Well, thanks for joining, Paul and Evie. Yes, um, you can find me on LinkedIn as well, and um, much like Paul, you can also just Google my name and find me at the top of the search results. <laughs> as any good SEO will be able to do. Superb, thanks for joining us, Evie. And also joining us today was Luke. Yeah, again, been uh, awesome to be part of the conversation. Um, yeah, you can find me anywhere, really. Twitter, LinkedIn, I'm lurking online. Um, and then, yeah, that's it, man. Just Google my name like everybody else. And you'll be able to, I mean, if we as SEOs, if we couldn't allow people to Google our names and find us, we shouldn't be here. So like, great, unless you're Steve Smith, in which case you're really in trouble. Um, yeah. yeah, Google me, man. You'll find me somewhere. I want someone to say, just chat GDP my name. But <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks for joining us, Luke. And also with us, uh, with us was Dominic. Yeah, uh, it's been amazing. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. Yeah, just search me. There's a picture of me with uh, the London Eye behind me, which is very old. So uh, enjoy that. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Um, thank you, Dominic. Thank you all. If you want to join us live next time, sign up at majestic.com slash webinars. And of course, check out our other series at seoin2023.com. Bye-bye for now.